What's up, storyteller? I'm Clark Rowenson, the Magic Engineer, and it's time to talk about magic. In this video, I'm going to be talking about one of the topics I actually covered in one of my live streams. So the format may be a little bit different than you're used to. I sure hope you still enjoy the content, and we're going to jump over to that right now. Let's talk about the relationship between magic systems and discovery writers. Because when you have people like like me or people who are like plot heavy, we do tend to do a lot of the construction or people who are setting heavy. We tend to do a lot of the construction prior to actually getting into the story. So we'll have, we'll have factions laid out. I'll know, I personally will know how the magic works. I have a pretty good idea of where the plot wants to go. And I'll get a lot of that stuff sorted out before I even start writing a chapter, but that's not everybody. And this is something I, I discuss a little bit in some of the other videos where I talk about what I'm currently calling approach vectors. I'm, I'm not fully happy with that metaphor. I need to find a better metaphor, but I haven't yet. But the idea is if your, if your story is a place on a map that is sealed off by a bunch of gates and it's, um, your approach vector is which of the gates do you go through first? And a lot of that comes down to personal style, preference, and personality. And that's going to connect with what is most important to you. So discovery writers, um, they, from the clients I have had and the people I've talked with at conferences, they often, it's not that they don't have high importance on plot. Um, and this is where like personality stuff comes in, but they tend to be pretty heavily focused on, uh, character. And some of the more nebulous things like character and theme, sometimes the, sometimes it will be, sometimes it will be plot. And that's where you'll get people who have a little bit more structure as they go through. But discovery writers, I feel tend to have a connection to some of the vibes of their story more than anything else. And then they move from there. So part of what's sort of developing in my head related to the approach vectors is it's starting to seem to me like there's actually a ranking that people have in terms of the different aspects of story and different things that can spark ideas for them. And the lower something is in the ranking, the more developed the story needs to be before they can truly connect with and understand that component. So for myself, and this is going somewhere, but for myself, I, it doesn't matter what I do with my characters before I start writing, they don't feel real to me until I am partway through my book. Magic systems, on the other hand, I can, I can map it all out and it feels right. And it feels real. Characters don't feel right. They don't feel real until I am partway through my book theme. At best, I figure theme out when I'm in like the second draft or something like that, because those are lower ranked on me. Now, lower ranking here, we're not talking about importance at all. We all understand that these different things are important to our story, but the way your personality and your brain works, there's got to be ones that you connect to more readily. So what I'm talking about here, when I'm talking about uh, developing magic for discovery writers, I am assuming I'm talking about people where magic is probably lower on their list of approach vectors. So they have to go through more of the story to get there. So they may not be a discovery writer per se, but they have to discover their magic through the story. They can't do it before they get into the story. So that's kind of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about discovering our magic system rather than planning our magic system. There's some extra aspects that come into play. So for, for the most part, again, going, I'm going to bounce back and forth between uh, discovery writing and discovering your, uh, your magic. Because uh, with discovery writing, you know, you wander your way through the book and then there's a lot you need to trim. And you can make your magic part of that discovery writing process. Because a lot of times the people I've talked to as they're going, they're just pulling in stuff that they think is cool. They're like, oh, this would be neat. This would be funny. This would be terrifying. This would be awful. And then they just meander through and then they have to edit things down and clean things up. And then it's part of how well they do the editing, which is the second part of what I want to talk about today is editing a magic system. But if you're a discovery writer and you're going through the discovery process of your story, 
what I would suggest, I think the thing that will help you the most will be to think of your magic and treat your magic as a mechanism to support and enhance the other parts of your story. I've talked about that before, but I think rather than thinking of it as a separate thing that you need to build and organize, just say, hey, I am discovering my way through the story and the magic is here to make this story better. Full stop. Don't worry about how it works. Don't worry about the interest. Like, don't worry about the rules, limitations. Don't, doesn't matter. You're discovering. So just think about it and focus on how it will make things better and just throw that stuff in there as you go. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, and as you're going through, when it comes to actually building the magic, uh, just throw, sh throw shit in there. <laughs> just make, make stuff up, uh, make it up on the fly. I know that's something that people complain a lot about in like published books, saying it feels like, oh, they're just grabbing things as they need it, and yada, yada, yada. Again, you will be editing your book. You will be editing your magic system. So for now, that's fine. Don't think past that. Just make it up as you go. Grab the things and toss it in um, and add it to the discovery process. If you want a little more structure and you're getting to a scene or you're at a certain spot in the book and you want to you want to add magic into it, but you're not quite sure how, um, I talked about using it to support but you can focus on, I would recommend focusing on things that will cause problems, things that will make the situation uh, more interesting or make the situation more nuanced. So if your characters are going along and they need to, I don't know, pull a minor raid, they need to go on a raid and extract materials from somebody's office, right? You have that set up. And now you just start making up magic shit to make that more difficult. So you already, you're probably already going to have, because if you think about it, we need somebody to break into an office. What's going to be in their way? There's going to be locked doors. There's going to be alarm systems. There's going to be guards. So you can add magic stuff onto that as well. Magic trip wires, magic alarms, magical barriers, magical locks, magical guardians, all kinds of things. Throw in the stuff that will trip up your character. And then you can also counter with, well, how am I going to overcome these obstacles? I guess I'll give my character the ability to do that. The reason I say to focus on the problems, I know, like, I talk a lot about how overpowered characters are boring. If you are going into these scenes planning on using the magic to solve the problems, it can be, it can be almost too easy to develop that kind of case where a problem comes up and then you just solve it with magic. It doesn't mean you can't use the magic to solve problems. It means you want to use it to complicate things more than you use it to fix things. And if you're focusing on that and allowing yourself to do the other, you will probably come closer to the balance you need. Hey, quick break. Just want to say if you are enjoying this video, please do take a second to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. It helps tremendously. And that's all I've got. So back to the content. So again, problems, uh, making it more difficult, making it more interesting. So maybe, maybe think the stakes are just higher. So if we go back to, uh, just the example of needing to steal a record from an office, well, the magic might make it more interesting if there is, I don't know, some kind, some kind of ticking clock where they have a certain amount of time before the magic reacts. And it goes into like a full magical bio clean of the facility, destroying everything that is alive inside it. Um, again, that's, that's kind of a problem or making it. So it's not just, it's not just a lock you need to deal with, but, um, it is, it is a lock with a magical key or the capabilities of the guards are magically enhanced where you are taking a problem that already exists and you're enhancing it and supporting it and making it more unique and interesting by adding magic into it. So for example, going back to the guards, right? Maybe the guards are shifters and the guards are mostly an animal form, or at least some of them are an animal form. That makes it interesting because now it's not as simple as just looking out for the humans who are patrolling. You need to find another way 
to spot all the various life forms that are around and determine which ones are intelligent and which ones which ones are problematic and how to deal with their different senses. Same core barrier, but you have made it more interesting and you have added nuance into that barrier they need to overcome. So uh, that's that's really where I think you should focus as you're just going through stuff. If, you, if you're stuck and you don't know where to pull in magic, uh, you can do that. Another thing you can do is if you know, if you have a theme, um, and this goes back to what you're wanting the magic to support. Again, I'm defaulting into using it to support the plot. That's what I'm, that's where my brain usually goes. You could do the same thing with a character. You know you want there to be a tough character decision. And maybe that is they need to decide between grabbing the plans or leaving somebody in danger. But you could also um, you could also add some magic into play. And whether that danger is magic, magical or the danger is caused is by the magic that, or you can make it so that the magic is forcing the decision. Um, all kinds of stuff. You can use the magic to uh, parallel and as an example for things that you want the characters to learn and grow from, or as kind of a counterpoint as something they don't want to be. So that's using it to support character moments and adding the magic in for your character moments. Theme, if you have a general vibe that you want, that's both theme and genre elements, honestly. Like, if you're doing a cozy magical mystery and you don't know what to do in terms of magic, just think, what would make this feel like a cozy magical mystery? I'm just going to plop that in there. I'm going to plop in a talking cat. There's going to be bird alarms. And uh, this person is going to have herbs. Uh, like strung up around their house as a barrier because that's not super threatening, but it is interesting and it is magical. Um, so making sure you understand what you're going for and then just grabbing things to make it connect. But again, I think you should primarily focus on stuff that is going to make it more interesting, more nuanced, or um, serve as examples for what you want to happen rather than a direct solution for a character moment, right? If they're dealing with a trauma uh, or they have a hard decision that they need to make, you don't want to come in with the magic and say, here's the magic to make the decision for you because that robs your character moment, right? The point of that moment is them dealing with that conflict and coming to a decision. So you don't want to just come in and be like, here you go, the magic makes the choice for you. Or, for, or again, if we go back to trauma, they're dealing with a severe trauma or a panic attack, you don't want to just come in and be like, okay, I'm just going to give them magic so that that calms it down and they feel better and they can go about their business because you just defeated the point of that moment. But if you bring it in and you have characters having a panic attack and when they have their panic attacks, they lose control over their magic. And this is happening while they're trying to sneak into the facility. So they're having a minor panic attack as the guards are closing and things are going wrong and their magic is starting to go haywire and get more difficult to control and causing other things that's going to make it more likely for them to be noticed. That is more interesting. So that's, um, that's one of the things that I recommend if you're, as you're going through your discovery process and trying to add magic in, that's how, that's how I would recommend thinking about it. All of this stuff is recommendations and guesses because I'm not much of a discovery writer. As you're doing this, actively limit how, how freely you and how often you use the magic to make your characters, your protagonists, powerful, awesome, or badass. A little bit of that is good. Too much will very quickly start dipping into the... Um, the Terry Sue side of things where it feels like it's just kind of wish fulfillment. You're putting yourself in their shoes so that you can feel awesome and powerful and not having the same compelling story. Again, all of this goes out the window when you're dealing with the genre that OP characters are the point, but really, really watch that. You don't want to overdo it. So again, it's something that's going to happen naturally. You don't want that to be your first go-to. How can I make magic? How can I add magic into here? Well, I'm going to bring magic in to make my character awesome. Or I'm going to bring magic in to make him look like a badass. Resist the urge and try and focus on the nuance and problems instead. And you'll probably end up with a better balance. This is where it's always weird. I, I, I hope this stuff is helpful. Um, 
my own imposter syndrome and insecurities. There's a lot of this stuff that as I'm talking about it, I feel like I'm just repeating advice that you have already heard. Um, hopefully it's helpful in this slightly different context. But for example, this next piece is really just for discovery process in general. Um, cause discovery writing, as I, as I understand it is basically, it's a long form version of brainstorming, a very long form version of brainstorming, depending on how you do it. So treat it like brainstorming. Um, allow yourself to have bad ideas. Don't worry about things being cohesive or making sense. If you're going through, it's like, oh, I didn't, <laughs> I just brought up a random clue that I didn't mention anywhere earlier in the book. That's fine because you can go back and add the clue. Um, you're brainstorming. Things aren't going to be connected. Things aren't going to be smooth. And that's okay. Just allow that to happen and focus on getting through the discovery process before you delve into trying to fix it. Discovery writers especially, especially need to develop a solid relationship with their internal editor so that they can shut the, shut it off or just tell them to come back later. Um, the most difficult clients I've had were like, not necessarily difficult on my end, but difficult in terms of like, we've had a really hard time getting them done with stuff are the ones that need to do discovery writing, but also have a hyper fixation on doing everything right the first time. So they end up in this process where they will get a little bit through and then they will go back and they will, that's a lot of times where I see somebody just repeating like the first third or whatever, and then they do a complete overhaul and start over and they really need to push through the entire discovery process. So, um, that's it. And just give yourself give yourself permission and psychological freedom to explore these things and to do things bad and do things messy. Very important with discovery, especially important if you are adding, if you aren't used to adding magic into your discovery process and you're now going to do so, just give yourself permission to do it bad. And that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting. As always, you can leave questions in the comments below. I'm also going to leave some links in the description. So if you have some questions you want me to address in any of my live Q&As or you have topics that you would like me to cover in these kind of live conversations, you can click those links, fill out the forms, and I will uh, potentially cover your topic in one of these future live stream slash video recordings. Thank you again. And whatever you do, make sure that you keep writing and stay awesome.